Hi, and welcome to the Kentucky Opera, located right here in downtown Louisville. Opera is an art form that started in the 1600s and has grown in its popularity and styles over the years. Let's take a behind-the-scenes look here at the Kentucky Opera to learn more about this art form and how an opera company creates a production. already decided what opera is based on the many comic images used in the media. But opera is much more than that. Webster's Dictionary says that opera is a drama set to music and made up of vocals and orchestral accompaniment. Opera has changed over the last 400 years to be a reflection of the human condition. The Kentucky Opera opened its doors in 1952. Moritz von Baumhard, a native of Germany, masterminded the operations of the Kentucky Opera. He was a vastly experienced conductor, but also designed sets, trained singers, and directed the staging. In addition to the standard repertoire, Baumhard always presented one opera a year, which was new to his audience, and he always managed to do one Mozart opera a year. Baumhard retired in 1982. Kentucky operas were first presented in the Columbia Auditorium and were moved to the Brown Theater in 1963. The opening of the Kentucky Center for the Arts in 1981 allowed Kentucky Opera to do more grand operas there, while still presenting medium-sized operas at the Brown. Today, statewide outreach and the essential cultivation of the next generation of opera lovers are the concerns of Opera Go Round, the educational wing of the Kentucky Opera, which each year gives over 100 performances to over 50,000 students in the region. From humble beginnings, the Kentucky Opera is now the 12th oldest opera company in the nation. But before 1952, many things took place to get us to this point in time. In the 16th century, people in Europe were starved for action and art. While Shakespeare was writing his plays in England, we can find a group of musicians and scholars in Florence who called themselves the Camerata, which is Italian for salon or meeting place. Different from the beauty salons of today, these were social gathering places for the upper class, and these intellectuals and artists sought to develop something different than the music of their time. They wanted to revive the musical style used in ancient Greek drama and be the first on the 16th century's alternative music scene. Opera is a unique art form because it is the only art form that was created in a committee with its exact origins and original purpose known and recorded. Operas were so successful that they soon became the rage all throughout Italy. To the south in Naples in the late 17th century, a composer named Alessandro Scarletti developed the Neapolitan style, an exciting and uplifting style of singing. The Neapolitan style of opera and other styles, such as the comic opera, spread quickly throughout Europe. Comic operas, which came into popularity around the time of the creation of the U.S. Constitution, may have been laughed at instead of laughed with, if not for a man named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart, who wrote his first opera at the age of 12, is credited with turning the comedic opera into a respected art form. During the 19th century, after effects of the French Revolution had changed European society and political structure, which helped opera play a role in establishing national identities. 
In Germany, around the time of the American Civil War, the stout and loud Richard Wagner developed the music drama. Wagner and his powerful operas became the representation of German art at the time. In Italy, dramatically vigorous Giuseppe Verdi and others remained focused on human passions and smooth, expressive, and often spectacular vocalism as subjects in their operas. The French developed the visually spectacular and lavish grand opera in Paris, or as the French say, le grand opera. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, Opera became more international. Americans, like Scott Joplin and George Gershwin, have an influence over opera at this time, as operas incorporate folk, popular, and jazz music. Folk operas, like Carlisle Floyd's Susanna and Douglas Moore's Ballad of Baby Doe, which came around the time of Sputnik, helped further establish the American opera style. opera company has many choices when it comes to producing an opera. We try to have a mix of historical styles and during the time that I've been here and during the time I hope to be here we would like to widen that circle so that the 400 years of opera history are eventually represented on our stage and all of their wonderful different styles. So there's one thing. We like, we like a historical context. We like a good balance of tragedy and comedy, though I must say in opera there are a lot more tragedies than have been written than comedies, and most of us prefer laughing than crying, so that presents a daunting challenge. We have to also do works which are appropriate for our performance space. There are some pieces that require very, very large forces of singers and orchestra, and that is not appropriate for a company of our size at this time. There are also operas which have in it a very small cast and could not benefit from being in a hall such as the main one we perform in, which is Whitney Hall, which is a 2,400-seat hall with a very large stage. So there are a number of very sort of routine, practical considerations. This season, we wanted to present, again, a varied repertory. So we started out with La Boheme, which is a 19th century piece, Italian. We then added Carlisle Floyd's Susanna, which is a 20th century piece, and we haven't done too many 20th century pieces at Kentucky Opera for a while. And I wanted to end with something called Deflator Mouse, which is an operetta, which is a great deal of fun, and is written by the Waltz King, Johann Strauss. I'm here in this great costume area of the Kentucky Opera, but we'll get back to that later. Although some of the leads in a major production are nationally known singers hired by the opera company, many singers must openly audition for a role in a production. In the fall, Kentucky Opera sends out a fax announcement of our probably next two seasons of what operas we're going to do. And then I schedule 100 auditions over three days, and they have a 10-minute slot for their audition, and the singer brings their own accompanist, and they come and they sing for us for 10 minutes. So once those round of New York auditions are done, then we meet again after that, and we talk about all the singers that we listen to, and we go by each opera, and we say, these are the roles, these are the people that are in this opera. Out of these people that we heard, who do we think are going to be good in that role? And there's usually, I'd say, anywhere between four and ten people that we think are going to be good for the role. Of 
chorus singers are normally local and they're either older professionals who still like to sing. Um, our opera course also has very many students from the University of Louisville. And they will sing, they audition, and sometimes they end up singing um, some of the secondary roles or compromario roles within the opera. Do you want to just have a bar before? Is that enough? Yep. So the bar he comes in on? While he was in the creek baptizing, he stuck up behind some bushes, and nobody seen him, but we all seen him when he ran away. That's a little... What? Western omelet right there. That's right. And you were very interesting. That's interesting. He can't either. And then he gets it, as you will get it. In a regular stage play, uh, the actor determines the emotional timing of what they say. In an opera, the composer does because he only gives you so much time to think and respond. Uh, also, when you're an actor in a play, no one's standing in front of you conducting, and a whole orchestra doesn't depend on your accuracy. So it's a very different thing. Also, it takes enormous energy to project your voice. So opera singers are really extraordinary people because they have to deal with learning all those notes, uh, thinking about their emotional response, and, and adjusting their responses to the timing of a composer. We were lucky enough to talk with the writer and composer of Susanna about creating an opera. It's hard work. That's the, that's the first and I would say foremost element is the fact that it takes a, a very long time uh, if, especially uh, in my case, I do the libretto and the music. So it sort of doubles the amount of time invested. But it's a good three-year project to do a, a full-length opera, uh, at least for me and I think for most composer librettists. Uh, and the reward is that you hope to, uh, uh, to come out with uh, uh, something that will be exciting to see on the stage and uh, and also that will have the have the capacity to engage people's interests and emotions in the process of seeing it so that's the reward is seeing it come to life we asked mr floyd why he used the american folk style in creating susanna well i wrote it in the 50s uh and I think we were all probably more conscious in the 50s than we are today of establishing an American style in musical theater other than the musical comedy, uh, a kind of serious musical theater. Uh, in the case of Susanna, obviously, uh, it's set as I did it, uh, as I set it in the uh, Tennessee mountains, uh, the folk elements, because the folk elements are all mine. They're not, uh, I haven't appropriated pre-existing folk materials. But, uh, but they're used to suggest locale because it's amazing how quickly music can define where you are or how quickly music can define an emotional situation or dramatic situation. That's its great power. Um, so that uh, using folk-like materials really establishes a basic color and, as I said, does suggest the locale in a piece. I am the Reverend Olin Blitch and I've come to New Hope Valley of devils and conquerors, sin it bravely sinners to repentance, to bring the word of the Lord and the power of his judgments. Oh, I am the Reverend Olin Blitch, and I come to New Hope Valley. But we expected you here tomorrow. Sets, costumes, lighting, and makeup are just a few of the many elements of a production. So let's go meet someone behind the scenes. This is Josette Miles, and she is the first hand in the costume shop, and this is Josette's domain. So, <laughs> hi, could you tell us a little bit about yeah. the costumes? Hi, Anne. Okay, this uh, specific gown is a ball gown, was made for Traviata, mm -hmm. Spef uh, specifically made for uh, Marilyn Mintz. Mm -hmm. Now, are all these costumes from no. Traviata? We have some, those were Otello costume. Here we have Queen of Spain. 
that's a replica from a book, a period book, was made completely in a costume shop. Wow. All the detail and everything, copy from a book. Wow, that's beautiful. Now, this is where all the costumes are stored. Where do you actually make the costumes? We go next door, and it's a costume shop where they get cut and sew and fit and, you know, till he's ready to go on stage. Great. Well, let's go look at it. This is the costume shop, and I want to introduce you to Karen Rivera, costume coordinator for Flat de Mars. Hi, Karen. Hi. Well, this looks a little bit different than what we saw for Susanna. Could you tell us a little bit about your job as a costume coordinator for Deflator Mouse? Sure, I'd love to. Um, first of all, it takes place in a whole different time zone than Susanna. Uh, Susanna was what we would call a contemporary piece, which means that the clothing are going to be more what we know of and are familiar to, mm -hmm. OK? What this opera takes place in is at the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So the clothing is completely different, and so are all the accessories. There are a lot of things here that, of course, people wore then that we don't wear any longer. Okay. And that's exactly what we are doing. So we're recreating what people wore at the end of the 19th century. So we have women in long gowns with petticoats underneath, mm. massive amounts of fabric that they have to move around, obviously, and not trip on. <laughs> and then we have the men, because there's a sequence where most of our men are in a ball sequence where mm. they're dancing. They're all da uh, dressed up in tailcoats with formal wear. So they're going to look very dapper. Great. Well, that's really neat. Yes. And then we have uh, a lot of the accessories, mm -hmm. again, that women used in those days. Some shoes that have the uh, laces and the um, hook areas to uh, fasten them. And then a big item was fans. Women used fans a lot at the end of the century for um, communication, to hide their face if uh -huh. they were shy or if they were talking to a friend. <laughs> so these are the things that we give to the people, and they have to learn to work with them on stage as well as sing, walk, <laughs> and use their fan at the same time. Great. Well, thank you. This is really interesting. Thank you for sharing this with oh, us. Oh, sure. Well, I'm glad you could join us. As we get closer to the performances, we start adding more and more of, of the elements of the production. Um, we will, for instance, after they have like a final run through in the rehearsal hall, we'll move into the theater and they'll rehearse in the set. And then the next rehearsal, they'll rehearse on the set with costumes. And then the next rehearsal, we'll add wigs and makeup. And then finally, we'll have a rehearsal on the stage with the orchestra playing in the pit. So we're kind of adding an element of production each, each day. So finally, we'll get to a final dress rehearsal where we'll have all the elements, and they've all been rehearsed at least once. And then that's really our final preparation for performance. So we're really adding incrementally to the complexity over the period of three weeks to get to an opening night. company is made up of a diversity of careers. Only a few of the people responsible for a production ever walk on stage. We have uh, musicians on staff. I am the musician on staff here. Uh, you have marketing people, you have development people, uh, you have ticket people, you have costumers, you have production people. There are lots of different things that go into making an opera, both in terms of preparation for production uh, and in uh, selling productions. I mean, after all, we have to sell tickets. Uh, advertising. Uh, then we have a whole department of education uh, where we do outreach to the schools uh, to try and inform them about opera and help them experience opera. So there, there are a lot of different things that one can do in an opera company. You don't have to be a singer uh, to be involved in an opera company. We are back in the Todd Clark Rehearsal Hall, and behind me, the full cast is starting to arrive. With just one week left until the opera Susanna opens, attention to detail is on everyone's mind. Mr. Speak your, speak your rhythm on, speak your line once in rhythm. Two, three, 
for. You're mocking us with your laughter. You'll regret it, you'll see. When your brother's caught, I'm sorry. When That's your right. brother's caught and strung on a tree. Yep. I would suggest, as with all of you, because some of these have really fast syllables, just memorize what syllable you're on beats one, two, three, or four. You're going to have to, inevitably, with some of those, like those triplet sixteenths, you're going to have to fudge a little bit in order to make them understood. Very careful, kids, oh, that you're behind yeah, the line. Yeah, you really do. Okay, I'm behind it. Do it, all right? And on we go. Remember. We do the notes at the end. I think one of the great joys about conducting the production of Susanna and Carlisle Floyd's music is they can be moved by it. And to me, I find that to be a very exciting experience because it's what we spend all of our time doing. We spend our weeks rehearsing it, and we employ so many different professionals, singers and actors and stage directors and technicians and lighting designers and we invest so much in each production in, in that we want very much for them to be successful. We want them to mean something to people. There are lots of things that go on uh, between us and the orchestra that we need always to be in a dialogue with them uh, and because they are our collaborators, collaborators uh, and we like that uh, and we're very pleased that they're uh, taking the time to be involved with Kentucky Opera. This is it. All of the work goes into these moments when the production company and theater audience share a live experience. First, we'll see a glimpse of Kentucky Opera's Susanna, then Deflator Mouse. <laughs> Domestic list, my friends, so there will never be an end. 
to explain the excitement of attending an opera in person. But I hope that this has given you a taste of the wonderful art form known as opera. Visit an opera company in your community and share in the excitement of over 400 years of musical tradition.